one of the effects of the glorious weather that we had this week, and then today it was hailing, so I, I don't know, I don't know what's going on. It's spring in the Pacific Northwest. Um, is the amount of pollen is <laughs> unbelievable. We are surrounded here. Uh, Gratefully, uh, we are in the forest, and so we have a certain amount of the evergreens for which Washington State is named, for which the college that we were once tenured at was named. Um, things like western red cedars and Doug firs and noble firs and and such and um, and others. No pines, um, but a lot of a lot of those. But and the, and uh, but white right now we've got um, the most common deciduous tree, sometimes called a big leaf tree, broadleaf, broadleaf tree, I guess, uh, is a big leaf maple. And we've got a lot of them here. Which and is, it's a periodical green. It's a periodical green. Yeah. It's deciduous, which is also known as periodical. <laughs> um, and they are just, they are, they are horny this week. <laughs> they are having a lot of pollen. The, the male bits. <laughs> yeah. We don't know about the female. Bits. I haven't asked. Yeah. I haven't, I didn't ask the men either. <laughs> the men trees <laughs> didn't need to. They no, I don't want. I, I should not. Park. I should not play with the word man like that. But I didn't ask the male trees either. But here they are. It, you know, everything, every surface. I was. I put my hand down on a windowsill. So I'm like, oh, and our our beautiful black cat is coming inside. His toes yellow. His rump yellow. So we have a anyway. <clears throat> this little <clears throat> in the throat is about pollen right now. Well, I actually, I'm going to pat myself on the back here, physiologically Can speaking. I do it for you, or you. you could but that's weird I'm here's the thing um i have had pretty severe allergies and we are having a hell of a pollen season yes we are um so far i yeah. got it under control you know this 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 is of course a conversation that could go lots and lots of places but you know i never i never had seasonal allergies at all and uh just in the last couple of years I, you know i don't i'm not sneezing my eyes aren't watering particularly but i definitely feel it in my throat which is where anything will go when it when I get got uh, any kind of pathogen or your immune system thinks it's a pathogen and it's going to go after it even though it shouldn't. Um, so that that is interesting because really I mean, we had every window in the house thrown open for both the perfectly glorious day and the slightly cooler day that preceded it. And as a result, uh, pretty much everything in the house is yellow now. It's, it's all coated in pollen. It's all, it is all coated in pollen. Yeah. Um, I, I will just mention that uh, after I had had COVID in our recent bout, mm -hmm. um, I had lingering stuff for a long time. And yeah. uh, I thought it might be long COVID. It may have been uh, a little bit of long COVID. It's medium COVID. <laughs> but at some point, um, the symptoms that I had experienced when I was still eating wheat that I had not known were symptoms of a wheat allergy started coming back and I was kind of ignoring it. And then the symptom that is the most conspicuous to me, it's not the worst symptom by far, but the numb hands when I'm sleeping mm. came back and it was like, okay, wait a minute. Am I eating wheat somewhere that I don't know? And I started eliminating things that had shown up, you know, in the right time frame that they could plausibly have been and nothing, nothing, nothing until finally I cut out all of the supplements that we have been taking um, to prevent COVID and other diseases. Yeah, D, C, magnesium, zinc. Right. And I got better very quickly. Yeah, and I think I think what happened is I was stuck in an inflammation cycle. One, one of those supplements has something in it. Well, I'm pretty sure. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to test this because it's going to involve me. Uh, if I'm right, it's going to involve me messing myself up again. But yeah. um, what happens, and it's not the first time I've been here, you think a supplement doesn't have any wheat because it doesn't say wheat anywhere on the label. But unless it says something like certified gluten-free, which in my case is a weird thing because I don't think it's gluten as we've talked about here before. It's a it's some other molecule in wheat. Um, unless it says that, if it says something like vegetable um, um, gelatin, mm -hmm. right? That is to say gelatin of a non-animal origin, that can contain wheat without them saying the word. And so I don't know if that's what happened, but it turned out that the vitamin D of which I was taking a substantial amount does say vegetable gelatin on it. And so anyway, I'm now in the uncomfortable position of scientifically the right thing to do is to go back on it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but from the point of view of like living a life, it does, it's not an exciting prospect to me. Right. Well, and at least um, from the perspective of, but what are you going to do for your D levels? We're now in the time of year when uh, we can, when the sun is high enough in the sky for enough hours a day that you can actually generate D here um, in at, what are we at? 40, 
I don't know exactly what our latitude is. Actually, that's strange, but it's 40 something. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 40 something for sure. I want to say 45, 46. I'm not actually sure. I may be off by a couple of degrees. Um, but I guess it's over um, any place over 35 degrees north or south of 35 degrees south. There's some period of the year when um, the sun is simply never high enough in the sky on any given, on any day um, for, you know, some, some days, weeks, or months in the winter um, that you can generate D at all. Um, but we are, um, we are out of that period now and it's warming up and at least you don't need the D in order to have the D in your system. Yeah. Now, for those of you wondering about what this means about where you live, I, um, we have recommended and I'm going to recommend even more strongly an app called DMinder. DMinder allows you to know when in the year you can start making vitamin D, when in the day you can start and when it is no longer possible based on your location. It allows you to integrate things about your own physiology. Anyway, it's a very, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but it is worth investing the time in this thing. So I just went on it for the first time after I was out for, you know, two hours on the water. Yep. Like, okay, let's, let, let's see what that means, you know, for, for me. And yeah, you can plug in a whole lot of stuff about your age and your weight and your height. And because, you know, the, the, the heavier you are, the heavier set you are, um, the slower your D acquisition. Um, and the older you are, the slower your deacquisition, and the darker your skin, the slower your deacquisition, and there are some other things too. But you don't need to include any of that, right? right? Um, the the thing that it can tell you that is like clear, simple, quantitative data uh, is just tell it where you are, and it will know. Therefore, um, what your latitude is doesn't care about longitude, and um, well. It doesn't care about longitude with regard to D, but it also, if you tell it exactly where you are with regard to latitude and longitude, it'll tell you, uh, it should be able to figure out, or you should tell it how high you are, your altitude, because um, basically the less atmosphere between you and the sun, the faster you make D as well. And of course, the faster you burn. So there's a trade-off always, uh, but uh, having a sense of, okay, given where I am and what day of the year it is, um, what is the, you know, is there a window in which I could be making D from the sun and what is it? And it's useful. Okay. One last thing here. Mm -hmm. um, what I think we have learned as we have built up our understanding on D is that supplementation is important for people who live above a certain latitude because we're almost all deficient. In the part of the year. Right. But supplementation is not a great replacement for self-made photosynthetic vitamin D. That's right. And so the point is, one of the things that this, I was looking at this app when I was out on my bike ride, uh, and I was looking at when in the year you can start making it. Turns out to be the day before my birthday. February 20th mm. is f for Portland, the day you can start making vitamin D. Now, how much can you make? Very little. Right. How much are you likely to make? Almost none. Why? Because February is cold. And so you, even if you go outside and even if it's sunny, both of which you know, are iffy at any given moment in Portland, um, the chances that you'll make substantial vitamin D are very low. The number of... The idea being because it's cold, you're covered up. Right. And so, you know, the more of your skin is exposed, the more vitamin D you're making. Right. So, in, in any case, we are something like 100 days into our... Uh, no? No. All 50, right. 45 50, or 50. 45 or 50 days mm -hmm. into a... 200. And I have to look at the app to figure out exactly how many total days there are. But the point is knowing if the point is you want to make vitamin D that you're, you will then store in adipose tissue, mm -hmm. which will then be released over the winter when you can't make vitamin D, right? Then the point is, well, there's a clock ticking in terms of how long you have to do it. And in fact, the clock in which it's practical to do it is pretty short because it's when the sun is shining, it's warm enough for you not to be overly covered up. And knowing that is a, is a power tool with respect to um, total vitamin D you can produce. Absolutely. And I mean, I was thinking about this too. It's, it's, it's been a trope uh, for a long time that you know, people, old people on the East Coast um, go to Florida in the winter, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, you know, we grew up. We grew up in LA, which actually it turns out is at a latitude where you can make D all year round, um, which I didn't know until I looked at this app, right? Um, but the idea, of, and you know, and lots of people who aren't old, um, who you know may or may not be spending the entire winters in Florida, uh, will vacation in in the Caribbean in Florida for a week and you know we we know that it feels good i mean this isn't something that we ourselves have done but you know we've done similar things um you know, 
obviously when it's cold out and you're stuck inside and it's gray and it's dark, um, what you're craving is a blast of heat and blue sky and just ease, right? But it's it, that is partially your body telling you, you need this. This is good for you. This is healthy for you. And it's, it's novel in that to go from a place where you're making no D at all. And therefore, if you're Caucasian, you're probably really, really white. And the first day you go out, you're going to get burned. And then the rest of your vacation is going to be kind of miserable because you got burned the first day. So you have to be much more careful than you would be if you were in a place that had just a fluctuating level of D with a fluctuating height of uh, the sun in the sky over, over the year. You have to be more intentional about your exposure as you first begin to get exposed, as I did, you know, on this, on this just, you know, two, two and a half hours out on the water. Um, but you know, it was the first time that my shoulders had seen the sun in, I don't know, five months. Yep. It's a long time. And um, it just, it reminds me that even many of our modern cultural things that seem cute, not very serious, um, may well be driven by our bodies actually informing us of what they need. Yeah. Uh, and actually this will come up as we get into some of the other content here, but you know, there is a way in which uh, tan, for a Caucasian person, tan looks healthier, right? Mm -hmm. um, that may be about something. And we may have gone through a long period in which, um, frankly, what we now should understand is paranoia over sun exposure. It's not that sun exposure causes cancer. It's that sun burns cause cancer. And mm -hmm. you can have sun exposure without a sun burn, right? Mm -hmm. Learning to modulate that may be a key skill for life. And, you know, and this has huge implications also for things. Flu is much less of a deal in the tropics. Right. Why? Well, vitamin D production is, uh, possible all year round. Okay. Well, that's good. Why did COVID hit so hard in, uh, was it Guayaquil? Mm -hmm. well, in Guayaquil, if it's in the tropics in a place, you know, it's near the equator, right? Yeah. Well, right near the Guayaquil is really unpleasantly hot and humid. And so I'm not saying that this is what happened, but my hypothesis about what happened in Guayaquil would be that the capacity to make vitamin D was overwhelmed by people acquiring air conditioners, which dehumidify and cool buildings. And in that hot, sticky environment, if you're not just sort of condemned to hot and sticky and you get used to it and you stop noticing it, mm -hmm. but there's a place to retreat that's cool and drier, right? People will tend to do it. So what I would love to know in the prediction of the hypothesis is that actually there's vitamin D deficiency in Guayaquil that, for example, didn't uh, doesn't um, match what there is in Quito, which is at high altitude, is naturally cooler and drier, is a great place to make vitamin D because it's less atmosphere between mm -hmm. uh, between you and the sun. Um, so anyway, these are all parsable questions, but the fact that there is generally less of this issue in the tropics, right, with interesting exceptions, suggests a pattern to be learned from. 